Welcome to the special programme on the music of Lado Byrne, a talented fiddle player born in Sligo over a century ago and who spent most of his life in America. Despite his talent as a musician and composer of tunes, he has remained relatively unknown. But in this broadcast, we will open up the book on his life and times. We will hear from those who knew him, and of course we will hear his music. So let's begin with a set of tunes, including one of Ladoburn's reels, from Leonard Barry on Illum Pipes, Declan Folan on fiddle, and Shane McGowan on guitar. Throughout this programme, we'll hear from musicians who will play tunes from the repertoire of Lado Byrne, some of which he is known to have composed, as well as other tunes from the Sligo area. We'll also look at how his love of music of different genre influenced him throughout his life. James Lado Byrne was born in South County Sligo in 1911. He attended the local national school at nearby Calavo. As well as receiving his education here, James, our lad as he would become better known, was steeped in traditional music from an early age. And that part of South Sligo has become famous for developing what is known as the Sligo style of fiddle playing. We'll hear now from another fiddle player who has grown up in that tradition, Philip Duffy, followed by the New York Connection, a duet from Brian Conway and Rose Flanagan. Thank you. 
Sligo has produced musicians of the calibre of Michael Coleman and many others who drew on the incredibly rich vein of traditional music in the area. One of Coleman's teachers before he himself left for America was Ladd's own father, Philip O'Byrne, an important figure in shaping the musical trajectories of these young men and many others. And what other influences were there which led to so many talented musicians to grow up in one small rural area? When we consider the development of music in South Sligo, and particularly around the Calaval area, it's very hard to overestimate the immense influence that Phil O'Byrne had on the region. And Phil was born in 1871, and even at that early stage, there was a huge amount of local talent, particularly fiddle players, in his immediate region. And we think about players like PJ McDermott, James E. Gannon, John Dowd, Matty Killorn, and it was straight into that pool that Phil was born. Phil then himself went on and became a major influence on many of the younger generation of fiddle players, not least on Michael Coleman, who said, everything I know about bone reels, I learned from Phil O'Byrne. So it was straight into this that Ladd was born. So when you're surrounded by such quality, it was no small wonder that Ladd became a fiddle player of such quality himself. I'll play a couple of jigs that Ladd will have brought from that immense South Sligo tradition. The first tune is actually a tune that was composed by his lifelong friend in New York, Paddy Killoran, and the second one is a tune he often played with Michael Coleman, Coleman's Made on the Green. <laughs> Communities are at the heart of our culture and creativity and in these extraordinary times we've been heartened by musicians who've shared their personal recordings and reflections of Vlad O'Byrne's music with us. Let's get to the first of these. This fiddle belonged to Lad's brother Dick O'Byrne and our next guest outlines how he came to own one of Lad's fiddle bows and what that means to him. Whether we realised it fully at the time or not, I think my brother Manus and I were extremely fortunate as youngsters, young fiddle players growing up in Sligo in the 60s and early 70s, having had an opportunity to meet some of the really great names, the great people involved in Sligo fiddle playing who had moved to live in America. Uh, people like Paddy Killoran and Lad O'Byrne are among the list. And of course, Lad um, was a brother of Dick O'Byrne, who was a great friend of our father. Dick was a very generous man and he gave me a bow, which I show you here, uh, which was owned by Lad and possibly even owned prior to that by Philip O'Byrne, uh, Lad's father, who was one of Michael Coleman's teachers. I had the bow restored a few years ago by the 
the world-class bowmaker, a friend of mine, Noel Burke, and Noel commented on the nice quality of the bow and the Pernambuco wood of very high quality. So it's a very treasured um, memento of, of that era. I'd like to play a tune for you today called Loud O'Byrne's Hornpipe. This was composed by the great composer Ed Reavy. Apparently I read that Ed had originally intended to call it Joe Reavy's after his son Joe, but Ladd loved this particular tune so much that um, Ed Reavy named it Ladd O'Byrne's Hornpipe. This is all that remains of the O'Byrne homestead in Bellinalac. I'm sure that in times past, these rooms resonated with music, song and stories. It's been many years since anyone lived here. But in tribute to all who came here to share their common love of our musical heritage, here's a tune. Thank you. 
when tragedy struck the family and Lad's mother Kate passed away in 1918 from Spanish flu, Lad, who was still a teenager, had to grow up quickly. With Ireland building its nascent state after the ending of the Civil War, there were few prospects here for him. So he followed in the steps of his county men, Michael Coleman and James Morrison, who had set sail for America in search of a better life. And his impact on the New York music scene, while different to that of his predecessors, Coleman and Morrison, nonetheless lasts to the present day. As we'll hear now in our next visit stateside, Brian Conway, this time for a solo, then followed by another New York fiddle player, Aaron Loughran. I've chosen two tunes to play that I very much associate with Lado Burn. The first one is called The Flog and Reel, and uh, I actually learned this from a recording of Lad. Um, the third part is a version or, or uh, an improvement on it that Lad had made, in my humble opinion. And the second one is a tune called The Grand Spay, and Lad and uh, Michael Coleman and Martin Wynn and Andy McGann all played it in this key, the key of D major. It's more um, commonly played in the key of C, so I'll give these two a try.
Ladd O'Byrne came to New York in 1928, just at the beginning of the Great Depression. Work was often difficult to come by, and in hard times he sought solace in his music. He met a fellow Irish emigrant, Louis Quinn, from County Armagh, and their shared love of music spawned a lifetime of friendship and musical interest. And now we'll hear from Louis Quinn's son, Sean, who inherited his love of music from his father and from his Sligo friend. Uh, the first tune I'm going to play is uh, the old air, The Coolin', which is one of the first tunes I learned uh, from my dad and from Lad. Uh, Lad was uh, very much a proponent of the Irish air. He loved to hear the Irish airs, and he always asked me to play this. When I was around him, all those many, many, many multiple times that I was with him at, at sessions, or just sitting in the house with my dad and him, and he would always ask me to play. He encouraged me to uh, continue uh, playing the airs. Uh, not many people bothered to play them. You never heard them really at sessions, uh, so uh, he liked that. So first, the cooling. During the Great Economic Depression of the 1930s, many immigrants found it very difficult to find work, and my father was no exception to that rule. And that's what brings us here to the Carnegie Library at 42nd Street in New York. My father, when he couldn't find work, would often come here with a ream of blank music paper, and just to teach himself the art of musical transcription, would go to the music room and transcribe Niccolo Paganini's violin caprices. In this way, he learned the art of musical notation. This broadened his knowledge of music and no doubt helped him when it came to his own compositions, arrangements, and teaching. And we'll return to James to give us further insights on Lad's life later on. But now it's time for more music, and we turn south to Galway for this segment. Ireland's foremost tin whistle player, Mary Bergen, accompanied here by John Blake, which will be followed by some of our younger musicians, Tom and Kate Gavin from Sligo, continuing the tradition of passing these tunes from one generation to another.
To the casual observer, the name Lado Burn may not resonate in quite the same way as those of the other New York Sligo fiddlers. Unlike Paddy Killorn, James Morrison and Michael Coleman, for example, his solo fiddle playing was not professionally recorded. But we do have some homemade recordings, along with one commercially recorded duo track of hornpipes featuring Lad with his great friend, Louis Crane. And while Lado Byrne became well known as a composer and musician at concerts and events in New York in the 1930s, his interest in other forms of music like classical music also influenced his playing. Another composer of music who lives in Sligo is Michael Rooney, and here are a couple of his compositions played by Michael along with his wife, June McCormack. <laughs> Thank you. 
coming as they did from the same part of South Sligo and moving in similar circles in New York, it was inevitable that Michael Coleman and Lado Byrne would get to meet, which they did for the very first time at a house party in New York. When he went over first, Lado, to America, and he was at this party, and Coleman was at it, and the music was going great, you see, and he was sitting standing next to the door. He was just over off the boat. And this, who was, the, the, the was, who was this quiet stranger standing inside the door? So he took no notice. But anyway, there was a lull in the in the session, and someone says, "Lad," she says, "Will you give us a tune?" And when Cornwall heard him, he stuck him to the to the ground. He couldn't believe it. Now he had heard pretenders before trying to come and compete with compete with him, and he took no heed of them because they were the one. They were just a joke to Coleman. But this fellow was no joke. So Coleman says to him, Will you join me in a tune? He says. So the two of them started playing. Now says Coleman, I tried my best, he says, to lose him. In every way, through, when you know, playing the, 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 the musically. I failed, he says. I failed miserably. <laughs> famous tunes associated with Ladderburn is the Providence Reel. A tune reputedly written by Ladd and Michael Coleman as they took the train to Providence outside of New York to attend a wedding in 1940. What a tune it is, and it's played now by Sligo fiddle player Shamie O'Dowd. That trip to Providence was important in other ways too, for it was at the aforementioned wedding that Lad O'Byrne met a niece of Michael Coleman's, Mary, who had been in school with Lad in Sligo. Their relationship blossomed and soon they were engaged and later married. Soon afterwards, however, he was drafted into the US Army to fight in World War II, where he saw action in France in the final two years of the war. His son James wrote in his memoir that during a lull in the action, he found a small abandoned crystal radio set. After tinkering with it for a while, he finally got the thing to work, and as he lay in the autumn darkness of the French countryside, the first sounds to come out of the tiny contraption were the faint tones of one of Michael Coleman's recordings, broadcast by faraway Radio Aaron. He told us that at that moment, he had never felt so lonely. And at this point, let's hear another tune, one associated with Coleman and Ladoburn, and before that, 
a few words from Miami-based fiddle player James Kelly, who crossed paths with Ladd while on a visit to Sligo's Fiddler of Dooney competition with his father John in the mid-70s. Listening to his playing, of course, it was obvious that he was a, a master fiddler and uh, had a great, great talent, uh, really on the same level as Michael Coleman uh, in terms of his great command of the instrument and uh, his virtuosity as a fiddler. And I would like to play these two reels for you now, two tunes that I associate with Lado O'Byrne and of course Michael Coleman's playing as well because Michael Coleman and Lado O'Byrne made a private recording, a home recording of these two reels. After the war, Ladd returned to New York. Mary and he began a family and had two sons, James and Richard. They lived in the Bronx before eventually moving to Woodside, where Ladd worked for many years as a cabinet maker for Louis Quinn's company. He also repaired clocks and watches and gained quite a reputation as a fiddle maker. He played extensively with people like Martin Wynne, Paddy Reynolds, Andy McGann, Patsy Cawley, Vincent Harrison, Ed Reavy, and visitors from Ireland like Joe Burke. This photo from 1947 shows the range of musicians in his orbit and pictures a young James O'Byrne on his knee. The O'Byrne household was often filled with music, so let's find out about one special night in the company of his son, James. This is 3703 62nd Street in Woodside, Queens. My father and mother, my brother and I, moved to, to this home from our home in the South Bronx at 139th Street and Cypress Avenue in 1960. My mother and father lived here for the last 20 years of his life until 1980. This home, like our home in the South Bronx, was filled with music and was for many who came a place of musical pilgrimage. There were many spectacular nights of music in both these places, but one comes back to mind among all the others. At midnight, sensing that the musicians were more numerous than normal, I turned from the piano and actually counted 
those in the room by instrument. There were 19 violins, five flutes, an accordion, and I at the piano, 26 of us in all. And what a great night of music that must have been. And while those house sessions may happen less frequently now, there's no doubt but that the tradition of passing on music continues. Here in Sligo, in New York and elsewhere, traditional music, heritage and culture have been shared with people all over the world, which has been evident over the past 60 years in the work of Coltus Kjolteri Erem. Well, I suppose when they went to America the first day, uh, the music was a badge of identity for them. They were, I suppose, very, very much excellent when it came to playing music and, of course, the standard of the tunes and so on. So there was a huge Cade Meal of Fulcher for them in the Irish community. And, of course, it was a rallying point as well for the Irish socially and culturally. So they would come together at various functions, house parties, concerts and so on. And, of course, the pride that that instilled into the Irish was very important. And because it spilled out into the broader community and was well received, so it created a very fertile ground for cultists back in those days because their music just didn't remain in America. It came back in various ways back to Ireland as well. And I suppose also when we were organising cultists in subsequent years, uh, we were going into areas, I suppose, not only where the music, but where Lado Burden and other musicians uh, were well known as well. And all of that, if you like, played into the bigger story of the Irish traditional music renaissance. Like all musicians past and present, Ladoburn absorbed from those around him, widening his repertoire and honing his style. But what about outside the arc of traditional music? As we've heard, he had a fascination with virtuoso classical musicians. But in the limited number of home recordings we have of O'Byrne, has his own music been infused with some of these influences? I would have to sum up that Ladd's style was pure Sligo. How do we know what that is? Well, for me, it's just an accent that I identify with. And um, it means that he sounded like Coleman. He sounded more like Coleman than Morrison or Killoran. But yet, it's, it's the accent in, in his music. And I think this is what defines regional styles. Just like when you hear a man talking, if he's from Donegal or Kerry, you know immediately. Well, it's like that with um, Sligo style for me. And Ladd had that in abundance. Um, I feel that he's, he, he had a really broad mind musically and didn't mind tackling the difficult keys, B flat and those type tunes. So that brings me to believe that he would have had a good awareness of the uh, maybe the classical music that was being played um, on early 78s and when he arrived in New York. The Boeing, I love the way he used to do those little stops. And it kind of got him to be back on track, you know, so that he could execute other fabulous Boeing techniques that he had. But he knew that he knew to get back onto them. I, I did use that comparison of the, um, the snooker player getting onto the white ball so that he could putt the black. Well, in, in a way like Lad's bow hand, he'd, he'd, he'd always have himself positioned that he could uh, take, take the tune up, you know, and elevate it to the way he liked to feel the tune. But um, marvelous bow hand, you know.
the music of Lado Byrne continues to inspire right up to the present day. Here's another personal reflection from Sligo-born musician Manus Maguire, who will be followed by Dublin fiddle player Liam O'Connor. So, Lad O'Byrne, uh, I first met Lad O'Byrne as a young lad growing up in Sligo. I'd say it was the early 70s, uh, when I would have been around 14 or 15 at the time, when Lad first visited our house. The connection there was that his brother Dick O'Byrne was a family friend of mum and dad. Dick and his wife, Noni, used to come over to our house regularly. So when Lad would be at home uh, in Sligo from New York on vacation, he would come over to the house with Dick and Noni and uh, play a few tunes and have a chat and a cup of tea with us. And uh, I remember him on one, one or maybe more than one occasion bringing his two sons as well, Rick and James, to the house. And uh, both fine young men, tall, both of them six feet four. And to my knowledge, one or maybe both of them were in the US military at the time. And uh, so they sometimes were cajoled into playing piano to accompany Lad for a few of the tunes at the house. I remember the, the tapes that Lad brought in particular, I remember listening to the fiddle playing of Andy McGann. So recent sessions that he would have had in New York with Andy McGann uh, were, were featured in it and Joe Burke as well, of course. And uh, it was great to hear those and to hear Lad himself playing a few tunes at the house. I particularly remember listening, listening to him and even though he probably was past his best at the time, you'd know by just watching his fingers that he had been a really, really good player. In fact, I remember Dad on more than one occasion telling me a story that Joe Burke had told him that uh, Lad O'Byrne was regarded as a top-notch fiddle player in New York by people whose opinion was highly regarded in New York at the time. So that said a lot. So it was many years later while touring in the United States that I got um, a homemade tape of Lad, one of Lad's recordings from friends of mine in Boston. And uh, I remember him uh, on th the very first track that I heard was would you believe it, the boys of the lock? And that was the tune that I remember Lad playing in our home many, many years previously. <laughs> I'd have James Laddoburn up there with the Michael Coleman's, the Porrick O'Keefe's, you name it, any fiddle player of the 20th century, I think Lad is uh, ranks as high as it gets. He had beautiful bowing, um, he had really elegant uh, variations, very crisp, uh, clear style, um, lovely tempo, kept things sprightly and moving as well, and sweet and a uh, lovely balance of um, energy and, and sweetness at the same time. The first time I heard him playing, some of the tracks, that's, it, and I'm talking about recordings here because I obviously didn't meet him, um, some of the outstanding tracks would be the Silver Spear, um, which I believe he, he picked up from Seamus Ennis here when he was on a, on a visit back to, to Ireland. Silver Spear is outstanding. I think 
the flogging reel as well. Um, some of variations in the flogging reel. I think at the second part as well. Um, third part as well, lovely variations, or lovely setting. Up to that high C natural and uh, just beautifully executed and great ideas. Um, another tune that stands out as well as the high level the compositions of James, James Hill um, was uh, from Newcastle upon Tyne. He composed this tune, the high level, uh, in honour of a bridge built over there in the 1850s. And uh, Ladd composed and added on a, an additional third part, which I think really captures the mind of a, of a, a musical genius in a lot of ways. Uh, it's very adventurous as well in its composition, it uses use of chromatics and uh, tricky little phrases. So this is the third part, the additional one associated with, it, or, uh, with Ladd. tricky number under the under things but very musical very playful i'll give the whole tune a try so the the high level composed by james hill and then the third part by james lalibert And um, when I think of that tune, I fondly recall a lot of evenings spent with Vincent Harrison in, in Dublin here. Uh, Vincent's originally from Leitrim, but spent many years in, in New York. And uh, most Friday nights, I suppose, from the age of about 16 till sadly when Vincent passed away, myself and Vincent would sit together normally over a bottle of red wine and, uh, and listen to recordings of, of Michael Coleman and Lada Byrne. And, um, Fitz would spend most of the evening trying to decide which he preferred and that could, that could change over the course of the evening. So um, I think Ladd formed part of a really important circle of, of fiddle players that were uh, you know, predominantly from uh, the Sligo tradition, but whose uh, music I think will stand the, the test of time. And um, it's, uh, every time I listen to Ladd, it's like a, a new fiddle lesson, you know, a reminder of, of, of how good Irish tradition music can be. And... Uh, He's it's he's like Coleman like that. Every time you every time you listen, you're surprised at how good it is. You I, I, I don't know what it is. There's an enduring magic there. The final chapter in the life of Lad O'Byrne came in 1980, when he passed away after an illness. His old friend Michael Coleman had passed away much earlier in 1945. Similar to other New York Irish musicians, he's buried here at St. Raymond Cemetery in the Bronx. Years later, Lad O'Byrne took the same final journey. My father passed away early on the morning of the Feast of the Epiphany, January 6th, 1980. And several days later, was brought here to rest in St. Raymond Cemetery in the Bronx. My brother Richard described Daddy's arrival home from the hospital for the last time. As Rick and my mother stood carefully on either side of him to ensure he made it safely up the stairs and then on into the bedroom, he turned instead for the living room where his violin rested on the top of the piano. He picked the fiddle up, put it under his chin, and even in the weak condition in which he was, he drew one last grand chord on the fiddle, then smiled and returned it to the piano and only then turned again and walked back to the bedroom. 
I've often thought that it was his way of ensuring that the fiddle was in tune in preparation for the next great session of music, whether in this world or the next. There's an expression we have in Ireland, which is Nila Neonrod Akshal, which translates as all things must come to an end. And so we must draw to a close this reflection on the life of a talented and humble musician. Lado Byrne spent his adult life in New York, where his musical legacy continues, but it's here in the shadow of Nakhnashi Mountain where he was raised. And we'll leave you in song from Neil Farrell, accompanied by her brother Sean. Thank you for watching and goodbye. Dear friends, we meet in love tonight, Uncle on the strangled shore. Three thousand miles from Marin's Isle that we might see no more. Far dearer still is that fair hill than any other to me. And in our own dear native tongue Streams down.